Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's, today's webinar on the future office of finance. Today's webinar is informed by Tapalti's recent report on the future office of finance that explores how the top priority for finance is preparing for the future by discovering new ways to connect technology, workflows, data and people to provide the most value to their organisations. My name is Nick Levine. I'm a chartered accountant and fintech consultant. And today we're featured by an expert panel featuring Dovi Francis, who is the founding partner at Group 11, and Sarah Spoyer, who is the CFO at Tipelti. Dovi, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yes, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the, uh, the police noise here. It's LA. My name is Dovi Francis, founder of Group 11. Group 11 is a financial technology fund that uh, I started about a decade ago. Over the past few years, we have invested in some of Silicon Valley's most disruptive financial technology companies, including Tipalti, Trip Actions, Sunbeat, Homelight, Adapar, Papaya Global, to name a few. Uh, excited to be with you here today and talk about uh, the future of uh, uh, Office of Finance. Thank you, Toby. And uh, if you don't mind doing the same for the audience, that'd be great. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nick. Um, so my name is Sarah Spoya. I've been the CFO here at Tipalti for three and a half years. Um, joined when the company was about 100 employees. Um, we're now uh, gearing up close to 1,000. So it's been a very fast growth trajectory here at Tipalti. Uh, Tipalti is accounts payable automation provider. We help to streamline the entire global's payable process for mid-market companies, everything from payee and supplier onboarding through to tax and compliance uh, collection of information from uh, the folks you're going to be paying, invoice capture, invoice approval, uh, the actual payments uh, into 196 countries, 120 currencies, and then on the back end, reconciliation to the ERP. Um, and, uh, you know, this is obviously a topic of great interest to me as I think about both how we use our own products internally to help automate and scale our business, uh, but also as we think about our broader CFO tech stack and the other technologies that we're implementing to help us uh, be more efficient, uh, be able to work faster um, and turn things around more quickly with better data insights and ultimately scale a very global growing business as efficiently as possible. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Sarah. So that's great. So we've got sort of two sides of the table, both the operator's point of view as CFO and um, the investors as well. So uh, really looking forward to you both sharing your insights. So um, before we sort of go into the questions, I just thought I wanted to kick off the um, agenda um, in terms of what we're going to be discussing. So during the webinar, we're going to be discussing um, overall frameworks to optimise the future office of finance um, of the CFO with our panellists, Sarah and Dovi. They'll each be giving us insights on the following topics. The biggest challenges facing the uh, modern AP team, how finance is transitioning to a strategic value driver and utilising FinOps for global expansion. So just a bit of sort of housekeeping um, before we sort of go into the uh, this first uh, sort of topic and wide, wider context. Um, please send your questions in throughout the presentation using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll be up saving some time to answer those at the end. If you are seeking CPE credits, you must stay on for the entirety of the webinar and you must answer our free poll questions during the discussion as proof of your participation. The Pulte team will follow up uh, post-webinar with CPE certificates, so hold fire for those. Um, if you have technical issues during the webinar, please submit them through the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen, which is also uh, yeah, so it's located at the bottom of your screen, and our tech team will help you out. So just in terms of sort of some scene setting, the findings of the report that we're going to be discussing um, today are based on three different surveys completed um, by more than 500 DFOs, CEOs, and finance leaders um, globally. The surveys were created in collaboration with leading professional bodies and market research companies, including the Institute of Financial Operations and Leadership, that's IFL, and Insight Avenue Research. Key findings from the Future Office of Finance report reveal that a revolution is taking place in finance teams, with finance as a back office function being replaced as key strategic partner across organizations. This is being achieved by accelerated digital adoption with finance teams of the future needing to be multi-skilled by e being able to perform data analysis as well as demonstrate communication skills by feeding back findings to the C-suite. Adoption of end-to-end -end automated finance solutions are speeding up the accuracy and availability of data, and this is also speeding up the close of monthly accounts 
as well as real-time data, empowering finance leaders to add value by looking forward and advising on value-adding activities, cash management, scenario planning, and risk assessment. Developments in connected finance are increasing automation and efficiencies further with leading tools enabling finance leaders to free themselves from disconnected silos and instead use technology to allow data to flow easily between accounting and ARP systems alongside third-party platforms. So the first topic um, we're going to be discussing and we're going to kick off with is current trends and the future of finance. So, Dovi, if it's okay, the first one for you I wanted to ask you is um, how are you finding um, automation is changing the way that workers interact with technology? We've got you, we got you Dovi. If not, I'll switch to... Uh, so we can come back to Dovi. Let's, can you let's hear me okay? with, uh, We can hear you now. Sorry, it must be cut out. Yeah. Do, you, do you need to repeat the question? Yeah, you got, it's a new techno- it's a, this is how automation interacts with uh, with me. So, so apparently yeah. I can improve. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> you know, uh, thanks for the question, Nick. We, we've written extensively about the, the power of automation in, in various thought pieces. In fact, in a few minutes, I'll share uh, one of them, uh, the most recent one. It's called The End is Near. In the, in the chat box for uh, you, yours and, uh, and the audience enjoyment. I think it's good to look at the automation from two lenses. One of them is from, from the lens of uh, C-suite level executives, so maybe the office of CFO or the office of the CHRO, CISO, et cetera. And the other one is from the employee's perspective. Uh, l- let's start with the office of the CFO for a second and talk about how C-suite level executives interact with that, and then we can touch the employee's vantage point, if that's okay with you. If I'm if I'm uh, if I'm talking too much, stop me, okay, Nick? Absolutely. I feel free to crack on for the moment. <laughs> all right, all right. So 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 I think you know in this environment where agility prevails, you know it used to be efficiency. Now I think it's uh, in, in an era of chaos. Agility prevails. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, you know within within uh, the enterprise, this with uh, uh, automation needs to be adopted. And anything that is manual, repetitive, mundane, uh, ne- needs to be streamlined. So, you know, the CFO or other C-suite level executives can, can focus on higher, um, you know, higher level tasks, if you will. I'll give you an example of a recent investment we have made. Uh, it, for example, we, we just invested in a company called Fintastic. Fintastic is a modern, uh, modern day Anaplan, if you will. So it's an FP&A uh, platform that basically uh, helps middle market companies uh, deal with uh, deal with budgeting and and with forecasting, especially at a time where companies need to turn on the dime. So, legacy uh, software solutions like Anaplan, which yesterday, uh, by the way, yesterday was acquired by uh, Toma Bravo, um, uh, are are extremely slow to implement. Uh, require require the involvement of uh, human beings and consultants in order to implement. Don't rely much on on APIs, etc. So, this this new era. Uh, automation solution like Fantastic basically integrates well within uh, the CFO within the CFO suite. I can come with numerous examples to that, but I think just wanted to give you a flavor uh, as to how automation is implemented in the organization level and and really frees up the time of the CFO uh, to respond really quickly uh, to management uh, and and to uh, adjust to various inputs that in a chaotic environment uh, change. Quite often, so that's from the uh, the CFO's uh, perspective or C-suite level executives' perspective. From the employees' perspective, may- maybe I'll take you guys back in time for a second, about uh, 14 years ago. So 14 years ago, uh, I was uh, I, I got accepted uh, out of business school to work at Deutsche Bank, and I remember really clearly uh, my experience working at Deutsche Bank, encountering quite a few inefficiencies that that kind of like um, uh, we're not really good use of my time, if you will. So let me give you one example. Corporate travel and expense management. Great example, right? So offices were here in uh, Century City in Los Angeles, but we used to travel often to New York for uh, for business. Traveling to New York required hours of work with Concur, right, which was the software solution back in the days that we used to work with uh, when booking our corporate travel. So, cor- so, so that would take a few hours just to book travel because it was an extremely inefficient software. And then the expense management portion following travel required us collecting the physical receipts, required us basically uh, scanning them in the office scanner, sending them to regional management, 
who then sent it to national management, who then sent it to the office of the CFO in New York, and then we got the rejects a few weeks later, uh, uh, requests for supplements and what have you. And of course, that was an extremely, uh, an extremely um, um, uh, time-intensive and inefficient uh, process. Where today, if you look at uh, you know software automation solutions, one of, one in particular is Trip Actions that does basically everything. It's a, a expense management and corporate travel solution bundled in in one uh, software solution. And if if you look at that, Trip Actions basically does everything for you, end to end, within minutes, without you having to pick up a single receipt. Uh, on your way out of a restaurant or, or, or a bar or an hotel and what have you. So, so definitely automation also releases the employees to do the things that matter to the enterprise uh, by automating processes. Okay, I'll stop here. That's my Sorry. answer to your question. Thank you, Toby. That's a really, it's a really good um, example. I guess what you're saying is, is it's that agility to have within businesses, but for the employee perspective, um, it's more satisfying for them because they're not wasting their time on mundane tasks and can more get involved in more value adding, more satisfactory areas of the business. Um, Sarah, with your with your operator's hat on, mm. you're really great. Um, if you wouldn't mind answering a um, question on, in terms of why, why automation first companies are helping drive greater career growth for that for finance teams. What, what have you actually seen? Have you got any insights related to that you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I think it both drives better career growth, but is also a signal of a company for which you as a, you know, potential employee and a candidate for that company, um, you know, will have a, a better experience and a faster growth as well. So I see it both as actually creating um, value um, through automation, but also as a signal of companies that are doing a good job here. And, you know, I, I think about it, like if you were a professional sports player, like if you were, a great baseball player, would you go to, you know, a club that didn't have, you know, automatic pitchers as an example to help you get, you know, a hundred at bats, you know, every 15 minutes than just, you know, 20. Um, and so I think these tools are there and they exist and, and across the office of the CFO, um, in, in every kind of functional area, you have modern, um, tools that are helping, um, finance executives, close the books on time, manage their financial operations, have better insights into their data. And, you know, companies really need to be implementing these or they're going to have, um, going to struggle, frankly, to, to hire, retain and recruit um, great talent. Uh, I was reading an article um, from one of the accounting kind of national organizations in the United States that was talking about how more accountants are actually retiring than are getting degrees in accounting right now. And so if you think about that in the, the workforce, you're going to have less and less um, employees to go after, candidates to go after, to attract, to do these types of roles, which means you need to take the most manual tasks that are out there, automate them as much as possible. So the folks that you are able to hire can work on the things that need a lot more kind of human knowledge, um, you know, knowledge transfer, um, insightful and value added work, and that they're not spending their time doing um, more kind of mundane and like, frankly, risky manual processes. So the first thing I'd say is better tools actually do create better career growth. Um, within my finance organization, as an example, we actually only have a handful of people globally who are working on some of those um, more manual tasks. Obviously for us, AP is taken care of because we use defaulty, but we still have some manual processes with regards to credit cards and expenses, some of the things that are, are generally some of the most manual that we're still looking to automate and improve upon. And so those are some of the projects that we're working on now. But in the last three and a half years, we've um, implemented a more modern ERP system, a more modern equity management system, a more modern um, close management process. We're in the process this year to do FP&A as well as um, a, a, a improvement to our revenue recognition and billing system. So these are all projects that are on our roadmap. We try to tackle two to three of them every year. And by doing so, both we are adding to the career development of the team on the ground that gets to work on one of these implementations because honestly, technology implementations is now a core part of financial leaders' skill set that they have to learn throughout their career. Um, but they're also then on the back end of those implementations having a much better you know, process to do their work um, with less manual interventions required. So, you know, I see it both as an important thing for finance organizations, but also an important signal. 
And I think that, um, you know, candidates are savvy as they look for roles in companies and they should be asking, you know, what is the tech stack that the CFO is putting in place and where are they um, investing in that tech stack? And are they investing in the places that are going to help me um, be successful in the role? Great. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> Some great insights there. In particular, I thought the point about um, less sort of talent coming onto the market, so that needs to do more with, with you know, with, with less, but also um, the importance of career development, perhaps through um, actual the workplace and, and technology integrations, if, if less people are coming out through, through university with those accounting degrees. Um, Dobby, in terms of the future of, of, of work and where this is all heading, um, what does this look like five or ten years from now? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. So, no pressure. <laughs> well, I wish, no, no, I wish I, I wish I could see the audience because I wish I could see yeah. what are the age, what, what's the average age of uh, of our participants. You know what? Let's just run a quick uh, poll through the chat box. Can you guys type your age range? How about that? Do thirty to forty, forty to fifty, okay? Uh, just so we see kind of like what uh, what we have here in terms of ages, and then I'll respond. Uh, then I'll respond Nick, to your question. I just want to get some engagement here to see sure. to see who's uh, who's who. The chat box is open for all to see, or uh, or not. All right. While I'm while I'm uh, while we're receiving some of uh, here, we're starting to get some answers here. Got, people are answering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we've got here, and you see, we got a real. Listen, we got a real range actually from. Okay, so from like thirty through to. Okay. Well, I would bet. I would bet. I would bet. That the, I would bet that the average age uh, of the audience is around fifty. How about that? And which, by the way, includes includes uh, myself at least here in the in the same kind of like vicinity. And uh, I don't know about others, but and then I'll I'll respond because I think this probably is the question that is most interesting to the people at the audience, in my opinion. It's it's a little bit amorphic, but. There's some there's such significant trends taking place right now with respect to uh, demographics in the workforce. And I think it's important to talk about it because because I think it, it allows us to better understand also automation, especially when you look at kind of like trends happening within SMBs. You know, we have 32 million, almost 32 million SMBs in the Americas, almost 300,000 middle market companies in the Americas and tens of thousands of enterprises. So I think it's important to understand what they're experiencing as well through the lenses of the demographic uh, changes. So first, we need to acknowledge the following. People who were born after 1980, right? They're called millennials and Gen Zers, okay? People who were born after 1980 account today to almost 40% of the workforce, right? Last year, they were 33%. This year, they're 40% of the workforce. By 2025, there will be 75% of the workforce. This is a new type of employee, it's a new generation. Think about them as, a, as, as almost like a digital nomad to an extent, right? Those people were born with a, with a smart device in their hands, right? They were born uh, into kind of like the edge of the industrial revolution, so definitely they, they were born pretty privileged. They haven't experienced any significant crisis to date, and I'm saying to date because another one is coming. Um, mm -hmm. they, they interact with technology different than their parents, uh, and, and they require democratization of services at large. They require immediacy of services. They require transparency uh, and, uh, and, of course, affordability. And, and with that luggage, they come into the workforce not only as employees, but now also as C-suite level executives. So you're starting to see them at the office of the CFO. You're starting to see them at the office of the CHRO. You're starting to see them at the office of the COO, CTO, and CEO, right? So, and I'm saying that as somebody who allocates, you know, significant capital to various financial technology uh, companies across the Americas, uh, and and uh, we, we're definitely seeing that trends evolving uh, right now, and and it impacts the way technology is being adopted and automation is being adopted in the in the enterprise. So I think that's first first thing is just let's just acknowledge that this thing is happening. The second thing is. Uh, um, the, the call it the um, the willingness to to function through automation, right? And and what we're seeing right now, and by the way, we'll see we'll see that trend accelerating further over the next few years. What we're seeing right now is that enterprises are far more willing. And when I say enterprise, I mean everyone, okay, from SMBs all the way to large enterprises, are far more willing uh, to uh, to use technology to reduce expenditures. Uh, uh, a, a, and to increase efficiency than ever before. 
based on a World Economic uh, Forum survey that was released last year, 43% of the businesses that were surveyed in that, in that uh, really res respected uh, survey uh, said that they, they are intending to reduce workforce and use uh, technology integration. So anything that anyone that does mundane, redundant job uh, is going to be eliminated uh, over, over the next uh, few years. We definitely see a lot of that happening in financial services amongst banks, especially retail banks, insurance companies, and what have you. So that's the second thing. The third thing that we need to acknowledge is, you know, what is the definition of work anyways? Now, I don't know. Uh, actually, we have some people who are in their 50s and stuff, so maybe they, you remember the song, 16 Tons. You remember that song? Uh, Nick, do you remember is there, is it? Who is it by? Uh, damn, I forgot the name of the, of the singer, but... Uh, but uh, it requires, uh, the, the, the way it, it ends, like, I own my soul to the company store. So, so those days of, you know, nine to five, they're, they're not over, right? As, as organizations, we still require employees to report to, report to work nine to five. But what we're seeing is that a, a large portion of the U.S. Uh, workforce, we have 152 million people in the Americas that are in the workforce, a large portion is starting to look at things uh, outside of nine to five jobs like the freelancer economy, right? So here is an interesting statistic for you, okay? And 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 uh, um, that that's given from from BEA and the various other um, articles. Fifty nine million people in the Americas, so about thirty nine percent of the workforce, thirty you know thirty to thirty something percent of the workforce, interacted with freelance work last year, and contributed about eight percent of our GDP last year through freelancer work. So so we're starting to see more and more of that. That trend is, uh, is growing really, really nicely on a Kager perspective, you know. And I think we'll see more and more of that uh, in, in, uh, in the near future going into the next couple of decades. So, so something to remember is that the definition of work is changing. And lastly, within, within the workplace, the definition of uh, what makes the new employee changes. So we talked about this new generation that comes into the workforce. Now let's talk about fundamental questions that they're asking that we have not asked when we got a job. Right. So when I graduated from uh, UC Anderson, got a job with Deutsche Bank, I was extremely excited to get a nice signing bonus, a nice W-2 uh, uh, salary, and, and a nice 401k package. Well, today, I think employees are asking uh, different questions. So one question they would ask would be like, okay, do I resonate with what the organization does? Right. That, the, the, that, the, value, the values question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do I resonate yeah. with what the organization does? Uh, uh, culturally, that, do I agree with it? Do, what about... Do, do, be, yeah. sorry, sorry to cut you off, because I, I think we just need to bring this bit to a... Because we've got some... I think we should move from the next question. But in essence, what you're saying is, in terms of the future, it's it's a, employees want to be aligned to, to values, um, values of organizations, that sort of um, restlessness in, in terms of, you know, expectations around sort of technology... And transparency and ultimately that's good it sounds like that's good for organizations that's what i'm taking away is that is that fair yeah in in, in light yeah. of the great resignation wave that is upon us and three percent unemployment and churn that is insane in various companies employees are looking uh, to resonate with the goals of the company and and various other things we'll touch it later great Th thank you Dovi. um we're now going to come on to our first um cpae poll question so you should get that popping up um in a minute and uh the question is what percentage of your ap slash finance team is spent on manual ap processes in a typical week rather than on tasks that aid strategic initiatives that's up to 25 percent 25 percent 49 percent 50 percent 75 percent and 75 percent plus so it'll be interesting just to try and understand in terms of the automation journey um, how far everyone is on that in terms of our audience. I'm just going to keep that open for another 30 seconds or minutes. If you don't mind, if you haven't answered that already, you can do that. That would be great.
few more seconds. Okay, so that's interesting. So it looks like 25, up to 25%, and then 25, 49%, the higher, they're the highest. So 32.2%. Okay, so it's interesting findings. We're not discussing that later on. Thanks to everyone for answering that. Um, the next topic we're going to be looking at is finance as a strategic value driver. Um, Modern finance teams are finding the best way to increase efficiency and produce fast and high quality information is to apply new tools to automate everyday tasks. And once automation has become fully embedded in finance teams, this creates an opportunity for finance leaders to contribute to the strategy of the business. This is an, another change we're, we're seeing. Um, Dovi, I want to kick this on, kick this topic off with you. Um, are businesses that embrace automation a characteristic uh, that you look for when deciding whether or not to invest in a business? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, absolutely. All of our companies uh, are, I consider them some kind of an agent of change, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so definitely, uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we definitely look uh, at businesses that have that, that same DNA when uh, making investments. Yes. Great. Okay. So in simple, Drew, um, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to get invested in, you have to be automation led. <laughs> Great. Um, and, 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 and Sarah, as, um, as, technology, as an operator, as technology continues to disrupt the finance function, how do you see the role of, of financing, finance continuing to evolve um, over the future in terms of the, the strategy piece? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, as, as Joey mentioned, he, you know, kind of he looks for companies that are going to be change agents and that are using technology to, you know, to their fullest advantage um, in how they're scaling their companies and how they're sharing data and, you know, arming their team with the tools to be successful. You know, often when I'm asked this question around automation and sort of digital transformation, I think about it in the form of kind of three things. So, you know, this um, automation, it unlocks your team, it unlocks the data, and it unlocks collaboration. And we've spent a bunch of time on the team part of it, right? How do you attract, retain your your team? How do you think about how the team can be more successful by using your kind of best-in-class tools um, in their own tech stack, be this the CFO tech stack or, you know, your CRO's tech stack and having the right tools for sales and marketing, et cetera. Um, and so I think we've already talked about the team piece, but I think the unlock data piece and the unlock collaboration piece is, is you know, just as crucially important. And so on the collaboration side, especially for growing companies who are going to become more and more complex, they're going to have people who are remote or they're going to have divisions or entities in internationally. Um, and therefore, they're going to have to collaborate across, um, you know, across offices, across time zones um, and work on the same set of data or the same project. These types of automation tools are incredibly important to keep everyone aligned and to keep the process um, really efficient. And that's true in the office of the CFO. And it's also true in, in every other department, frankly, across the C-suite, where you have these kind of dispersed teams in many cases that are all working together collaboratively. Now, I believe getting back into an office and seeing people face to face in person is really important. And so um, we are also doing that. But that doesn't um, take away from how important these tools are when you think about um, having, you know, global teams that are, you know, even if back in an office sitting remotely from each other and that collaboration is really key. So what I find in these automation tools, be it Depaulty from an AP automation or, you know, our closed management tool, as an example, we're able to track the tasks for closed management on a daily basis. We're able to track all of them, sort of who's completed it, who's reviewed it, who's approved it at every day of our close process, what percentage are we done um, until we reach to 100% of close. And we're able to do that, you know, even if in Israel on Sunday, our um, Israeli accounting team is working, but then Monday we're picking it up in the US. And so we're able to do it collaboratively because we're all using the same tool without even really speaking to each other. So these tools are really important for unlocking that collaboration and making sure people are just in sync with each other um, while they're doing their roles. Um, I think on the unlocked data side, it's even, you know, perhaps more value added. 
So what I'm seeing through these tools are insights that were previously very difficult to capture in real time, now being available at sort of, you know, the snap of your fingers. And so, you know, looking at accounts payable as an example, you know, we know exactly how much cash outlay we need for our payables for the next, you know, 30 days by day, by currency, by entity. Um, and that's a level of detail on um, your AP spend, which for most companies is the largest, you know, non-payroll spend um, that they think about, their invoice back spend. Um, and that's a level of visibility you just don't have if you don't have a tool that is automated, that's capturing that data for you in real time, because you might not even see that data until those invoices have been fully approved or until the budget owner has fully decided that they are ready to pay it. But we see it from end to end, even before those invoices have been approved because they're logged into the system. And so ability to capture that data, that's one particular kind of sub-function in the finance organization. But even more broadly, if you think about um, like data warehouse um, technology, that's allowing companies to bring data from lots of disparate sources, store it in a way that is available for querying by multiple organizations, being able to tie together the insights from disparate sources in a way that really um, helps you get to strategic um, insights more clearly and in more real time. These are crucial technologies that um, you know are just getting better and better. And so I really think that um, you know the finance team and finan financial leaders need to be champions for that type of change inside the organization. But honestly, it, it tackles almost every department in the company. Great, thank you. So I'm taking away from that data analysis skills are going to become more important forever for finance teams and I guess um, technology as an enabler to, to suit different ways of working, whether that's across time zones, um, working remotely or, um, you know, if people are going to have more flexibility in their lives in terms of the hours they work, it's being able to access that sort of live real time data, even if they're working on unconventional hours. That's great, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, wanted now present to you all our second CPE poll question, which is, on average, how long does it take you to process an invoice? 1 to 10 minutes, 11 to 25 minutes, 26 to 45 minutes, 46 to 60 or 60 plus. So we're going to keep that open just for a minute or two, if you don't mind answering that, that would be great. Open for a few more seconds. close that up now right so one to ten minutes 47 percent followed by 11 to 25 34 percent so that's if that's just one invoice i can see how that can really add up to a lot of uh spent time that could otherwise be better use to more value adding tasks that's great thanks everyone for answering that um so the third topic somewhat in relation to this is on ap challenges and ap automation and in some of uh, Tipalti's recently published research, I noticed a number of uh, fast growth businesses reported many AP challenges. Um, many of them were around time consuming processes, inefficiencies, complexity and, and risk exposure. And I think perhaps that was highlighted the, the results from one of the earlier uh, polls about the amount of time um, spent, financing spent on, on, on AP. That was quite a high 
percentage that said 25 uh, to 49 percent of their time was, was spent on that, which is en enormous. Um, I mean, so in relation to that and to, to, to sort of managing these challenges better, um, Sarah, what, one, one for you. How, how would you go about identifying, um, you know, which AP challenges are the most important and how you can solve them? Because there's so many different things going on in, in AP. Yeah, there is. And, um, you know, I think uh, I think you can broaden this question to really look at, you know, kind of general challenges in the financial operations and your kind of, um, you know, closed book process. And AP is um, one of the longest lead time items in that process for most companies. Um, obviously, at Tipalti, we use our own products and our products help us streamline a lot of those steps that are generally done manually throughout the, the closing of AP. Um, and so, you know, part of the, the solving of this is through automation, be it with Tipalti or through other processes, but it's about really driving, um, you know, for each step in your accounts payable process, everything from onboarding a supplier, collecting their W-8 or their W-9, their banking information, their tax information, through to actually capturing that invoice you know, the next step being really understanding is that invoice approved to be paid, which is a very cross-functional activity. You have to reach out to the departments to understand, you know, whether or not that good or service was delivered on time and whether there's any disputes for that payment, you know, through to actually scheduling the payment, um, paying and then reconciling it um, to the ERP. That process end to end can take a lot of time and it takes a lot of time over multiple people, over multiple steps, over, you know, days and or weeks, depending on how long. Um, it's out there. And and so automating that end-to-end -end process allows you to get that visibility and allows you to make it into a kind of a workflow that can be constantly managed in a way of kind of always be closing, always be updating on the AP, kind of always be pushing things through. So um, one of the things that we looked at at Tipalti as we were going into our 2022 planning cycle was let's look across all of our processes in our finance organization. Let's see what things today are keeping us up from having a shorter closed process or keeping us away from having a more streamlined financial operations process. And then let's figure out what those bottlenecks are. And if there's a tool or a process or a change in how we're getting and receiving data, let's really dig into those individual steps and try to clear those out. And, you know, honestly, we created a, a very long list of like pretty minute detailed um, processes and policies and procedures that we were doing and areas where we needed tools to enhance our process, not so much on the AP side, but in other areas of our CFO tech stack. And then we prioritized them and prioritized who would spend time working on those throughout 2022 to really bring down our closed process um, you know, almost in half is what is, is our goal is to split the, the time in half and then also help us with some of our financial operations processes to streamline those with regards to, um, you know, payroll, currency conversion and a number of other areas. Um, and what I would tell people here when we're embarking on this is, you know, first, it's really getting into the details of what is that full end to end process look like for you and your organization. Secondly, really to prioritize which of the things you could do that's going to give you the biggest, um, you know, kind of results, you know, for the time um, and in money uh, spent in those areas. Um, I then also look to the team to say, okay, what are people really interested in going to solve? So what things are, you know, really painful to the, the people on the team um, that they're really excited to go solve. And that kind of energy people had for certain aspects also drove prioritization because Honestly, you want people to be excited about going and solving these pieces. It's going to make the process even better. Um, and then lastly, my piece of advice here, and this is something that I think we've done well over the last few years, um, is when we're choosing tools to implement, and you can't implement everything all at once, but when you're choosing tools to implement to help modernize the tech stack, think about it not just with today in mind and kind of your current operations in mind, but make sure that you're choosing a tool that's gonna last, you know, minimum three plus years out, ideally could grow and scale with your business kind of as far as you have line of sight into the business. Um, because the one thing I've learned in this process of Tipalti is we've grown as fast as we have and we've added geographies and entities and countries and products as fast as we have, is that, you know, if I had chosen different tools or maybe said, hey, I, you know, this, this size of tool or this, this tool that's supporting companies of this size will be good enough for today, I would have been in a place where I was then 
changing that tool out, you know, two years later, which would just have added a ton of time mm -hmm. and complexity and a, a transition point that, you know, leads to risk and, and potentially data being lost or processes being having to be reworked. So what I really talk to people about is, you know, if you know you're going to grow internationally, choose, you know, an ERP that can handle multiple entities. If you know you're going to grow internationally, choose, you know, a RevRec tool or an accounts payable automation tool that can scale globally as well. Don't be in a situation where you're having to implement a tool once and then one year later having to implement something else just to keep up with the pace of your company's growth and acceleration. So definitely something to think about here as you're trying to um, think broadly around your your automation and, and tech stack. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So I think it's one thing I'm taking away from that, and it, that, this was actually in, from, from the research paper, um, there seems to be a, a misunderstanding of, of the full range of what, a, what AP consists of. So it's really mapping out that entire process, understanding you know, what those bottlenecks or, or pain points are to get those productivity gains sooner, but having very much that growth um, mindset. So um, you're not going to create new bottlenecks in two or three years if you continue to uh, grow and enter new geographies. I mean, Dovi, in terms of end-to-end -end, um, automation, do you, do you think it's going to be inevitable that, um, you know, all, all companies are going to end up running their finance um, processes this way? And, and what does that mean for the future of, of fintech businesses? Yeah. No, thanks, Nick. No, not not only finance processes, all processes uh, will be fully yeah, yeah. automated end -to -end, ultimately, right? And, and, and really, it's inevitable. You can think about it just... There are two uh, forces that are pressuring the organization to make those type of decisions, right? Change, change doesn't happen without exogenic factors, right? People are not, you know, people who are sitting at a, at a, at a cushy job are, are typically refrain from making those type of radical decisions unless they're forced to. And what we're seeing is that uh, across across various levels in the organization, people are forced to make those decisions. Number one, because uh, the the employee have changed, and we talked about the DNA of uh, employee changing, right? Second, just demo Coming under demographics, it. and second, was that? No, the yeah, the younger demo, the younger demographic coming through, yeah, yeah, well, becoming the majority yeah. in two years, yes, and and yeah, secondly, yeah. Uh, um, we as an economy, global economy, we stopped growing. Birth rate is at all time low. Fertility rate is at all-time low. Birth rate, consequentially, is at all-time low. Uh, a well below replacement of two per couple. Divorce is all-time high. Uh, and 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 the, you know, geopol geopolitics are you know uh, you know getting getting uh, getting um, you know um, crazier by crazier by the day. Uh, in, uh, the environment uh, is not predictable. We're entering a very chaotic environment. And in a chaotic environment, enterprises require certainty. And you cannot have certainty or anything close to certainty if you don't implement, especially with this like multivariable equation, if you don't implement technology end to end, right? So, so on the one hand, exogenic factors. On the other hand, internally within the organization, there are change agents who just joined uh, that require this speed, accessibility, meritocracy, and democracy of, uh, of services. Right. And so, and so you, what you're saying is, is it's just due to a number of factors, such as the birth rate, it's just going to become inevitable, basically. Well, you, you know, if you operate below replacement, uh, and and, and yeah. so economy doesn't grow. I mean, you can look at the you can look at the Japanese stock market since the '80s, and I think that will show you what happens if you operate below replacement. We stop growing as an economy. So, so what enterprises seek to do, if they cannot increase income. Right, is to reduce expenditures and increase profit margins, and that's kind of like the era where we're stepping into now. Of course, I'm not saying <laughs> there are variable there are various companies that will continue to make lots of lots of money, but generally, I'm just trying to generalize and just find a trend. I believe this is the trend the trend we're entering. Great, thank you. And I guess yeah, so in terms of profitability, it, it makes sense as well, right? So um, that that's great. Thank you, and thank you for showing that that sort of slide um, as well that we that popped up. Um, in terms of the fourth topic, we, we touched on this before, actually, gl global expansion. I mean, that's high on the agenda for many growing businesses as well. And that, that creates its own set of complexities in terms of um, sort of currency risk and compliance. Um, Dovi, sticking on the, on the automation point, how, how can automation um, 
remove pain points associated with entering new, new international markets? Well, you can go back to, to my slide if, if, you, if you're not there. Hold on for a sec. Are you, can you go yeah. one slide backwards? Um, I'll, I'll, elaborate. Back I'll elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I'll elaborate. <laughs> So, so I think I think um, you know Tipalti definitely solves for that with with the count tables across you know uh, I don't know uh, multiple jurisdictions, currencies, uh, AML compliance laws, and what have you. So fully automate this thing end to end. Uh, it solves a big big pain for many organizations. But when you think about the when you think about the uh, the growth of uh, of the enterprise to other markets, especially with respect to uh, hiring employees in various other jurisdictions. <clears throat> Is something that we'll see more and more of, as you know, as, as even in the Americas right now, it becomes extremely difficult for many tech companies to recruit uh, to recruit and, and retain talent. So it behooves you, mm -hmm. you know, to start exploring other territories. It can be South America. It, it used to be Ukraine. It was a hot market for a while. India, Southeast Asia, and what have you. Uh, in that respect, implementing software solution like Papaya Global, which you're seeing here on the slide on the left hand side can really help with looking at the new uh, the new US workforce as a more global and decentralized workforce that needs to be paid in various uh, jurisdictions, uh, time zones, and, and, and while adhering to various tax and compliance laws. So I think that's a good uh, that's a good example to a technology solution that solves for that. So do you think so in terms of all, as well as automation, it's the fact that these these tools are global by their nature. So can, it's, as well as the automation, it's how they can manage the complexities of, of those other markets. Yeah. yeah. Look, so, some software solutions were built especially to deal with with a global with a global enterprise. And Tipalti is one of them. Trip Actions is one of them. Papaya Global literally does that in, in order for you to retain employees globally. Uh, so some mm -hmm. some technology solutions are more uh, domestic in their nature. Great. Thank you. And I guess it's more. I said with that growth set in mind uh, that Sarah mentioned. I guess if you are going to internationalize, it's looking at taking on ideally these global solutions. Um, Sort of sooner in your in your sort of life cycle, um, Sarah. Just to to, point, to bring you into the conversation, if that's okay. I mean, what data points and insights can finance leaders um, use to help accelerate the international growth aspirations of the broader business? Yeah, no, it's a great question, and it's um it's one that we've been embarking on over the last few years. So I can definitely um, answer it with kind of real time data. But I think for most companies who are thinking about global expansion, they've likely had some amount of success of it already. You know, maybe they only have a US sales entity, but they're getting inbounds from Canada or the UK or Australia. And so they're getting to test the market um, without actually putting a lot of investment in the market um, and being able to see whether or not there is, you know, a market for their products internationally. And so, you know, one of the best piece of insights that we use at Topalti is looking at, you know, where we have um, you know, inbound leads coming in from where we've had success with um, customers, even though we don't have kind of feet on the street in those markets, where we're seeing the demand. Um, and that's helping us think about, okay, where is the market ripe for our technology that drives us to look into, are there any local competitors that are doing this well in that market? Um, it drives us to look at, you know, TAM, which we define as kind of the number of mid-market companies in a space um, or in a geography um, that would be, you know, prime targets for us as far as our use case, both um, in our AP automation product, which is what we've talked about today, but we also have a global partner pay um, automation product for kind of the digital economy. And so there's certainly a lot of growth in that economy and in those industries globally as well. And so one way to look and just kind of pull the data again, back to this, do you have, do you have a data warehouse where you're able to pull these insights together is, do you have a way to look at you know, inbound lead flows from your, you know, marketing tech platform, be it on Marketo or your, um, you know, Google AdWords style analytics, Google Analytics, whatever tools you're using on that side, can you combine that with your CRM that's capturing, you know, pipeline and opportunities by geography? And can you capture that with, you know, maybe market research data that you're bringing to bear around the overall TAM? And can you use those things to triangulate where you know kind of where you'd be most successful where the largest um opportunity is for your product or technology globally so that's kind of the first part and some of that is outside in but a lot of that actually can be brought forward through your own 
data sources if you know how to mine them and if you can connect the pieces between disparate data sources um, in order to, to capture that, especially if you can capture that over time. Um, because what might feel like a small number relative to your core mature market, if you see a lot of growth in that space because you've been tracking it multiple quarters in a row, that can help drive your decision-making process. So that's you know one, one way of bringing data to bear as you think about global expansion. I think the other role of the office of the CFO in global expansion type of projects is really to be realistic about what the complexity of global expansion is going to bring to the organization broadly. And there's a lot of things people don't think about when you know, you're in one market and you say, well, it's not that hard to add a second market, right? And it's just Canada, it's really close to the United States, it's always the, the joke you hear. Um, but in reality, in practice, you know, multiple entities creates more than just 2x the complexity. Um, you've got to think about everything from your employee experience in that new market to payroll benefits, all of your underlying service providers, your audit function, your, um, you know, your AP function, your bank accounts globally, how we move currency between places, how long does it take to set up bank accounts if you need core bank accounts in those countries. There's a ton of complexity just in the back office, frankly, for global expansion. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that you might need different types of leaders, different types of product leaders, different types of you know, feet on the street from a sales perspective, again, depending on what um, industry you're in. And so I think the finance team is an important group as thinking about global expansion to really help to base the, you know, the business plan in the reality of what this complexity will create but also look and say, okay, but now across our tool, our tech stack, our HRIS systems, our financial systems, our CRM for sales or our marketing systems, do each of them have the global capabilities for us to add that module that will allow us to now um, expand our current processes and systems to that extra geography? And then eventually, ideally, to multiple extra geographies as you expand more globally. Um, and I think the Office of CFO is in a really unique position to help all business partners think through what that, you know, one to two, and then ideally two to many type of growth will look like and to base the cost and expense and complexity that that will bring to the organization in as much reality as possible so that the planning can be done, um, you know, kind of in a realistic way. It sounds like a real opportunity there for the CFO and finance teams to provide insight into that decision-making in terms of entering new markets, but not just through the financial lens, it's more through the more holistic lens in terms of sort of business partnering and looking at how, you know, technology can work, sort of non-financial technology, as well as um, sort of finance tools um, as well. Um, just we're going to be bringing this to a close in the next few minutes. We are going to have time for one or two questions, but first of all, um, just wanted to finish with our final CPE question which is, have you received any feedback or criticism from the wider business about AP inefficiencies in the last 12 months? It's a simple yes or no answer. Fifty-fifty split. I don't think I've ever seen a polling question come back any more even. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, forty-nine percent is still 
is still quite high. So great. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for answering that. We've just got two or three minutes for questions. We've, we've picked out a, a couple. And we're just going to have to go for quite short answers, unfortunately, because we're quite pushed for um, the time. Um, I think this will be more appropriate for, for, for Sarah. What is the main reason for failure of finance automation projects? Um, yeah, thanks. And thanks to, um, I guess it was Juliana who asked the question. So listen, I think that there's mm -hmm. lots of reasons why automation um, automation uh, projects can fail. Um, and I spend a lot of time, just given our role that we sell into the office of the CFO, so I give, spend a lot of time with peers, CFOs, and just sort of learning from each other. And I always think there's a chance to learn from each other. Um, one of the things I think is the the most challenging as you think about automation projects is to do them well in a given year or a given quarter, you really need to prioritize what are the most important things you're trying to solve for. So, you know, ultimately it's not automation for the sake of automation, it's automation for the sake of saving time, getting better insights, work, you know, getting better collaboration, making your processes better, et cetera. And so you really need to find, you know, and prioritize you know, somewhat ruthlessly, hey, you know, in this year, we're going to tackle these things. I remember um, 2020, that was the year that we, um, it was the first year on our new ERP. So we basically went live on it on January 1st. Our, um, we, we got our close management up and running um, early Q2. We got our equity management, new equity, modern equity management by middle of Q3. And then forgetting one thing, we did a third, a fourth project in Q4. And that was a big changing year for the company. We also probably doubled the size of our finance team while we were growing into multiple markets at the same time. Um, and it was very well planned out and we had the resources planned out to do it. Um, and I think the failure comes when the you haven't really prioritized the goal out of, of what you're trying to solve for. And you haven't given your team time to work on that away from their quote unquote day job. And so, you know, you can carve out 25, you know, 30% of their time and say, you know, this quarter, your priority is to get this thing launched, the change management rolled out. Um, and you really need to be able to carve out that time for the team. And it can be hard to do that in a growing organization, but it's really important. And, um, you know, I think one of the reasons these things fail most is because you know, it's it's not as clear what the outcome is that you want, and then you don't have your team doesn't have enough time to do to do that well and to have some really concerted effort on the implementation that's needed there. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about this more broadly on implementations that can take anywhere from call it, you know, two to four weeks to maybe you know twelve to fourteen weeks. But you really do need that time and focus area there. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. And we've literally just got about um, a, a minute, but for, um, I, I actually, so I think we're actually, sorry, we actually have run to, we're running out of time. So we've got, we were sort of so busy chatting. So um, I'm afraid that's all, all the time we have. Thanks to um, Sarah and Dobby for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you again to Tipalti for making this complimentary webinar possible. If you have questions and we didn't get the chance to get to you, uh, did ap do apologize. So feel free to reach out via email. We'll make sure that we will get your questions answered. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joby. Thank you, Nick.